starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have this bullet story. This story comes from a person who is working in trauma surgery. One night they got a notification that a man had been shot three times in the head and was on the way in. When he gets there, he has literally one eye hanging out of its socket, blood everywhere, and he is slumped over. So it seemed that he had one bullet go in through his temple and out of his right eye socket, one bullet in the nose exited out of the roof of his mouth, and another went in his cheek and out the side of his head. The doctor goes over to examine him and is assuming he'll just be pronouncing him dead, but when he tilts the man's head back, he quickly says, yo, be gentle. The doctor accidentally screamed, but he was not alone as everyone in the room was quickly shocked at the fact that this man was still alive. I guess the entry and exit wounds showed that every single bullet had missed his brain and he ended up making it through the whole ordeal. In our number nine spot today, we have this eyeless face story. Before I get into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far because it really helps us out. This one comes from a nurse rather than a doctor, but I feel like it definitely still applies. She was working at the home of an elderly lady who had some learning disabilities and had also had her eyes completely removed due to a condition that she had from birth. The lady was apparently super nice, but had this habit of wandering around her apartment late at night in complete silence. One night, the nurse woke up and left her room at 2 a.m. to head to the bathroom when she had quite the scare. As she left her bedroom, she was met with the old lady who was silently standing in the hall as she turned her eyeless face towards the nurse. Imagine being in a dark room after you just woke up and seeing an eyeless face look at you. It honestly would be enough to frighten anyone before you realized exactly what was going on. In our number eight spot today, we have another eye story. This story comes from someone who goes by the screen name I'm Cuttin, and they said, I have quite a few stories, most of them are hilarious, and then there are those you never want to think about. What messed me up the most was when I saw how eyes change at the moment of death. Imagine you are looking at clear water, but that clear water changes to foggy in an instant. In my eight years here, I've only seen this once, and I've personally seen well over 250 dead or dying people. This is one thing that I've always thought that I can't understand how healthcare professionals do. I definitely don't think I could see people die all the time, especially not when it's like what he just described. In our number seven spot today, we have a car accident story. This story comes from a person called Jeremy Howell, and they're recounting one of their mom's stories. Jeremy says, a guy came in from a car accident and was losing blood. In the midst of resuscitation, the man jolts awake and screams, don't let me go back there. Please, please, please don't let me go back. A few seconds later, they lost him. Um, what? Like imagine, that would scare me half to death. Seriously, you guys. In our number six spot today, we have this dead guy moaning story. This story comes from someone who goes by the username I'll do it later from when they worked at a hospital. They said, one of my duties was to help wheel patients who had expired down to the in-house morgue. Once we were wheeling an older man from the ER down the hallway when he let out this low moan. I started to panic thinking that he was coming back to life, but the registered nurse explained to me, in brackets they have newbie, that sometimes the air in the lungs doesn't come out until sometime later or it is delayed for a bit. While I definitely feel like whoever this story is from should have definitely already known this, that would be so scary for a second when you don't know what is happening. In our number five spot today, we have a crying blood story. This is another story that comes from a registered nurse, but it definitely needed to be mentioned in this video. A 24 year old man came into the ER one day with flu-like symptoms. He had some sort of rash that sadly ended up being a symptom of failing a battle with bacterial meningitis, and it was causing him to bleed internally. He was in such bad condition that he started crying, but his tears were blue. Blood. She said she could see how scared he was in his eyes, which is so sad to think about. He ended up actually passing away and the nurse whose story this is had said that in her long nursing career, this is the one that just really stuck with her. In our number four spot today, we have a whole story. This story 
comes from someone called Pete Lancosta and is a bit of a gross one, so just a warning. Pete says it was someone who had a massive hole under his right arm, creating a cavity where you could see and hear whistling from the right lung. It had been worsening for maybe 10 years, so the initial injury had mostly healed. Honestly, you guys, I almost couldn't read this one out loud. I can't imagine what that would be like for all parties involved in that situation. In our number three spot today, we have a tumor story. This story actually ended up being published in a medical journal for how crazy it is. A 90 pound 16 year old girl came in one day with flu-like symptoms, a sore right side with a bit of a bump. They went to check for gallstones, but it actually turned out to be a tumor. It ended up being removed the next week and it turned out to be a seven pound tumor that was as big as a dinner plate. This is not normal. It was so big that it had outgrown its blood supply. That's insane and so yucky. I'm glad this one came out with such a positive outcome though. We needed more of that on this list today. In our number two spot today, we have this intestine story. This story starts off on a wild note from someone who is explaining one of their mom's stories. It goes, apparently one guy walked into the emergency room entrance holding his intestines in his hand, calm as can be, and shouted, can I get a little help please? I think I'm gonna die. Now this dude wasn't gutted wide open holding all of his entrails, but he had a pretty major cut to the midsection causing some of his intestines to be protruding externally. This dude is alive and my mom told me she had no idea how somebody could walk into an emergency room like that and be so calm. Honestly, props to everyone in this situation for remaining calm because it undoubtedly saved that guy's life that day. In our number one spot today, you guys, we have this rising from the dead story. This story comes from someone who goes by Simple Simon 6262 and is honestly pretty crazy, but also kind of cool. They said, when I was a student, I got called in on a stroke patient. She had coded and they were doing CPR. They worked for 45 minutes, but she died. They cleaned her up and called on the family to say goodbye, but by that time, the family had left. She had been both brain dead and without a pulse for more than 45 minutes. Suddenly, she sat up and called for her family. The nurses rushed to get the monitors and equipment back on her. They started working on her again. She stabilized, said goodbye to her family, and then promptly died a second time. That would be so insane to witness, but I'm also so glad that she got to say goodbye to her family. I honestly think that must be the reason she ended up coming back, even if it was just for a couple minutes. Starting off this list at number 10. This story starts off with a man who has had quite a few too many alcoholic beverages walking into the emergency department. This usually is not a great combination for the start of a story, and this one is no different. After waiting in the waiting room for a while, he eventually gets taken into a room to see the doctor. When the doctor asks him what's wrong, the man explains that he can't get his contacts out. He said that he was trying to pull them out of his eyes, but he just couldn't get them out and it was starting to be painful for him. The doctor goes to examine his eyes and to see if he can figure out what's going on. When the doctor looks at the man's eyes, he realizes that most likely because of the alcohol, this man doesn't realize that he must have already taken them out and that he has actually been pulling on his eye and not his contacts. The man ended up having a partial tear in his cornea and I am so glad that it wasn't worse because this story really gives me a shiver down my spine. Moving on to number nine. Motorcycle crashes are pretty notorious for having some gruesome scenes and this one definitely was no different. A man was brought into the ER after being involved in a crash when he was driving his motorcycle and he had a severe foot and leg injury. The doctor didn't know exactly how bad, but once he gets there, the doctor goes to examine the damage and decide what the next course of action should be. As he's examining the foot, he realizes that it is barely hanging on by a thread. It was so bad, he described it like a mozzarella stick that had been pulled apart. The doctor, of course, realizes how serious this situation is and of course gets this man into the operating room as fast as possible. Luckily, the doctor was actually able to save this man's foot and completely reattach it, which is amazing news. Moving on to number eight. 
This one is a pretty short story as this doctor didn't include a lot of detail, but it sure is disgusting. This doctor went to see a patient who apparently had an ingrown toenail, which honestly seems pretty painful. When the doctor gets there, he realizes that this ingrown toenail is actually just a toenail that is barely hanging on at all, and that the best solution at this point really would just be to remove it entirely. The doctor gets the toe frozen and pulls the nail off, but what he reveals underneath is what he never expected. There were actual maggots living under this toenail, and apparently not just a few. This definitely shocked the doctor as it was the last thing he was expecting to see, so it's no wonder this experience really stuck with him. Moving on to number seven. This story is told from the patient, but definitely shocked the doctors who were there that day. A 10 year old girl noticed a bump on her tongue one day, but didn't think too much of it. The next day, however, the bump had really grown and it was freaking her out, so she told her mom, which is the right thing to do. Her mom took her to the emergency room where they waited for a long time because that's what you do at the emergency room before they were finally taken into a room to see the doctor. The doctor comes and the girl is waiting to hear why she has a bump on her tongue when the doctor says, I've never seen this before. Her mom is in the corner crying out of worry and this 10 year old girl thinks doctors know everything, so she's obviously freaked out that he doesn't know what's going on. Five more doctors and the chief of staff came to take a look at this bump and they decided that the best course of action was to poke it. They applied a local anesthetic so that it wouldn't hurt, but she could feel the pressure as they poked around. The doctor then asked, when was the last time you ate popcorn? The 10 year old replied a few days ago as she could clearly remember since she was trying not to chew it loudly while she was watching the X-Files sewer monster episode. As it turns out, a popcorn kernel had suctioned itself to her tongue and since the tissue on your tongue regenerates so quickly, the kernel was basically just absorbed into her tongue, which is what was giving it a bump. Definitely a pretty crazy story that I am glad had such a simple solution and ending. Moving on to number six. This story comes from the Reddit user Cow and is a story they got from their neighbor. His neighbor was working in the ER one day and described it as one of those days that is just bloody. She explained that there was an unbelievable amount of really bad nosebleeds that day for some reason, and she was constantly dealing with people who were getting woozy from their nosebleeds. A guy walks into the ER and as she turns around, she sees him holding a bloody rag to his face. She's thinking to herself, really, another nosebleed? She asks the man to lower the rag so that she can see how bad it is and he listens. When he lowers the rag though, she sees that his jaw literally drops, like almost completely off of his face except for a few tendrils of skin that were holding it on. She calmly asked the man to put his rag back on his face, which he does, and then she quickly escorted him to the trauma center so that he could get the help that he needed. I do not know how our healthcare professionals stay so calm in these kinds of situations because I would absolutely panic. Moving on to number five. This is a story that comes from a studying doctor's professor and it takes place in rural Alabama. A couple came into the emergency room after they had been quite intoxicated and ended up getting in a huge argument. During the argument, the woman and this couple accidentally fell off of their porch and into some shrubs. Of course, the argument immediately stopped and the man rushed over to see if she was okay. She was basically fine aside from a few scratches, but he noticed that it seemed like during her fall, something had gotten stuck in her arm. Since they had that liquid courage, plus I'm sure the worry about the cost of medical care, the man decided to get some pliers and just remove the object himself. He clamped down and pulled as hard as he could, but it just absolutely would not budge. He eventually gave up and they headed to the emergency room where the professor was working. He examines the woman and he very quickly realizes that she had a compound fracture of her humerus and what the man was trying to pull out of her arm was actually her bone. I hate that one. <laughs> Moving on to number four. This story comes from Lad Otelli on Reddit and is a story from when their mom was earlier on in her medical training. A man came into the ER with some foot issues, so she began to do a foot exam. Upon first examination, his feet were extremely gangrenous, which is usually what happens to a limb when the tissue starts to decay as there's insufficient blood flow. She quickly knew that there was a slew of issues she was about to need to take care of on his feet and decided that the best first step would be to soak his feet before dressing them. She prepared a basin of 
of warm water and placed his feet in there to soak, and while they are soaking, she heads off to get some other work done. About 30 minutes later, she returns to the room since the feet have probably soaked for long enough. As she goes to remove his feet from the water, she realizes that all 10 of his toes had come off in the water and were floating. <laughs> so gross. This story is another one from Lad Otelli on Reddit, as both of his parents were doctors. So this one comes from his father and is based in Scotland in the early 90s. Apparently it was a very sunny day for Scotland and one of the only days you would actually be able to get a tan. One Scottish man got a little too excited about the nice weather and rather than getting slathered in sunscreen, he grabbed some sheets of tin foil and covered himself in cooking oil. This is definitely not what anyone should do at any point, but unfortunately this man maybe didn't know any better. A few hours later he had to be picked up in an ambulance and taken to the emergency department, which is where Lad Otelli's doctor dad comes in. This man had burned himself so badly in the sun that he had third degree burns all over his body. Moving on to number two. This story comes from Sideshow87 on Reddit as they're explaining one of their father's stories as he was an emergency room doctor for 20 years. Just to make the story more clear, this user refers to his father as Dr. J. A patient came into the ER one night holding his stomach and the front of his jacket was bloody. Dr. J could tell that he was really out of it and he also seemed to be under the influence. Dr. J asked what was going on and if he could explain the issue and the patient responded that his stomach was hurting him. Dr. J says, let's take a look and goes to pull the guy's jacket and arms back so that he can examine the stomach when things take quite a turn. As the guy pulls his arms away, his intestines literally start to spill out on the floor, which really explains why his stomach was hurting so bad. The patient apparently very matter-of-factly explained how he sustained these injuries and how he realized he probably needed to go to the hospital. I'm sure this was definitely one of the more shocking days on the job for Dr. J. Moving on to number one. This story comes from someone who's recounting their dad's story as he is a doctor who we'll call Dr. K. Dr. K was off duty one day and went to pick up some pizzas for his family. As he was just turning onto the street the pizza place was on, he heard a very loud crashing sound. He turned around and realized that a motorcycle had just slammed into the side of an SUV. His face ended up taking a lot of the impact so his helmet flew all the way off of his head and about 30 feet into the air. Dr. K rushed over to help and saw that this man was in very bad shape and was struggling to breathe, but Dr. K did everything he could to clear his airway and then made sure his neck was stabilized until the ambulance arrived. The ambulance took 10 whole minutes, so it is definitely a very good thing that Dr. K was there while they waited. Once the ambulance got there, Dr. K told them what he knew and off they went. It turns out this man ended up suffering multiple fractures in a couple different vertebrae, an almost non-existent jaw, and other facial fractures, broken collarbones, broken ribs, collapsed lung, amongst a slew of other things. Flash forward one full year and Dr. K is working in the emergency room where he has worked for the last 20 years and he gets a page to come to the main lobby of the hospital. When he gets to the lobby he sees a man standing there that looks kind of familiar but he doesn't really know him. This man comes up to Dr. K and wraps him up in a great big bear hug and starts crying. That is when Dr. K realizes who this man is and of course starts crying as well. The man just keeps repeating, thank you, you saved my life. They chatted for a while about the recovery process and how his physiotherapy was going. Apparently Dr. K has said it was one of the best experiences of his life. Oh. That was so nice. I just liked the ending of that one, which is why I had to put it at number one, because it just really leaves you with that warm, fuzzy feeling. Starting off this countdown, we have The Price is Right. Earlier this year, several doctors in Michigan were being investigated after doctors were posting photos of their patients' organs on social media. The doctors were then playing a Price is Right game, being like, how much does this organ weigh? Take a guess. Very unprofessional. Plus, one of the posts showed a patient right in the background. Other photos photos sparked a competition with the caption, the longest one wins. Apparently this is what a number of doctors were playing with each other. They were caught obviously and the photos were removed. But that still is very unethical. Not only does it make doctors seem unprofessional, but it's also traumatizing for the patients who had their organs photoshopped and manhandled. Moving on to number 9, we have the victim. Back in 2010, a 60 year old
The victim was rushed into St. Mary Medical Center in LA. Sadly, they passed away after the doctors were too busy taking photos of the man and posting them on Facebook instead of actually treating him. He passed shortly after the photos were taken. Not only is this a breach of patient privacy, but it caused the patient his life. That time spent taking the photo potentially could have saved him. What's worse is that the photos were shared all over Facebook and over texts. So a man lost his life and they didn't think sharing images of him right before his death was wrong? How sick. In our 8th spot we have the Skull Saw. Take a look at this scary monstrous device. Aren't you glad it's from the 1800s and not now? This is a picture of the skull saw. It was used from the 1830s to 1860s during brain surgery. The doctors would crank this saw to cut through the skull. Thank gosh, times have changed. But still, I can't help but to cringe at the thought of that. Imagine a doctor pulling out that big device and bringing it close to your face. No thank ya. That's bound to make anyone scared of doctors. Coming in at number 7 we have the corneal transplant. Now I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to show this photo on YouTube so I'm just going to describe it in great detail just in case. We might have to censor it. Anyways, the photo I'm referring to is one of a corneal transplant. It features the patient's eye stretched wide open after the surgery. So you could see the damn stitches in the person's eye. Now I don't know about you but anything to do with eyes gross me out. Like in horror movies like Saw when people have to do stuff to their eyes, it makes me squirm and cringe. So seeing this and knowing that there's stitches in that sensitive area oh, gives me the creeps. Now this photo is obviously meant for medical personnel. Obviously, random people like us seeing it turns us off and might prevent someone from getting this important surgery. Coming in at number 6 we have the smoke enema. Thank gosh doctors don't practice this anymore. So basically, a smoke enema was given to drowning victims because it was thought to help resuscitate them or warm them up if they were in icy waters. So they'd insert it into their bum and force smoke up there. This was practiced during the mid 1700s until the early 1800s. It took them that long to figure it out that it wasn't really working. Now what I want to know is who the hell invented this and thought it was actually a good idea. All that would do is damage your colon or make you toot. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the dancing surgeon. Back in 2018, Dr. Wendell Davis Boutte in Atlanta was facing several malpractice lawsuits as she was exposed for posting videos and photos of her dancing while performing surgery. One of the patients was Latoya Archine. She was horrified after after seeing herself unconscious while her doctor danced around her. In another clip, her doctor is dancing while swinging her skin around. After the surgery, she realized that her flesh wasn't even cut in a straight line. She blames this on the dancing. Not only that, but her whole procedure was botched. Another patient of Boutte was left with brain damage after a tummy tuck gone wrong. In the end, more than 20 videos were found on YouTube. Boutte had to pay $190,000 in malpractice fees and 38 patients are entitled to refunds from their botched surgeries and she got a two and a half year suspension. Moving on to number 4 we have the disturbing photos of patients. So it seems as if doctors love taking and sharing photos of their patients. It happened to a 23 year old model who was taken to a hospital in Chicago after binging on alcohol. While in the ER a doctor took photos of her looking very anxious and disheveled and then posted them on Facebook and Instagram. Another example would be a doctor who took a picture of an attractive patient in the ER and posted her image on Facebook. He captioned the photo, I like what I like. That's disgusting. In another case, two nurses shared an x-ray of a patient that got a sexual toy stuck up his bum. A total violation of patient privacy. In our third spot, we have the storage of bodies. This is a very depressing photo taken at a Detroit hospital earlier this year. This hospital was so overwhelmed and overcome by death that they were running out of room to store the deceased's bodies. This photo shows the bodies in body bags piled up in random rooms at the hospital. It's very sad how many millions of lives were lost because of this pandemic. This photo serves as a scary reminder. My heart goes out to any families who lost anyone. Moving on to number 2 we have the big leak. 
Back in February of this year, hundreds of thousands of personal patient records were leaked online and were accessible for anyone to view. This included videos of patients, photos, body scans, x-rays, and pages of personal information. This happened due to the fact that the information was being stored on an unprotected server. 900,000 patient records were accessible online. Obviously, the hospital was in a panic trying to correct their mistake. That information should have not been out there for just anyone to see. In fact, it could have allowed hackers to create a comprehensive profile of their victims. These patients could have became victims of identity theft or fraud, you name it. And in our number one spot today, we have the unconscious patient. In 2013, a doctor from BC was suspended and fined after taking pictures of an unconscious and nude patient. He then sent this photo to another staff member. The photo was of the patient's catheter site. And not only that, they were making fun of the patient and sent the photo alongside a joke. In the end, the doctor was fined $20,000, but that was to the College of Physicians and Surgeons. I don't even know if the patient was compensated. I hope they were though, that is absolutely traumatizing. They also were only suspended for six months. Absolutely sickening. Starting off this countdown, we have the car accident. About a decade ago, this nurse used to work in a suburban hospital. One night, there was a multiple vehicle accident, and one of the accident victims arrived to the ER with his foot barely attached to his leg. It was just dangling from his ankle. Apparently, when his car was struck, his foot was at a different angle from the rest of his body, so when it received impact, it literally snapped right off. This nurse was traumatized after walking by his bed and seeing one normal foot and then seeing the other just dangling there with his tendons and ligaments completely visible dripping with blood. In our ninth spot we have the haunted hospital. Of course hospitals are haunted. Any place where lots of deaths occur are usually haunted. According to this next nurse, she arrived for her shift early at around 6.30 am. Around that time, things were pretty quiet around the hospital. So she gets into the empty elevator and heads on up to the ninth floor. Floor. But instead, it skips her floor and ends up going to the 11th floor. The doors open, no one was there, so she closed the doors and clicked the 9th floor button again. When she arrives, she gets off and sees an old woman standing directly behind her in the elevator. I would have had a heart attack. Clearly, this ghostly woman got on at the 11th floor and was hitching a ride down with the nurse. That's terrifying. That's certainly one way to get your heart pumping in the morning. In our 8th spot, we have Nearly Headless. This next nurse witnessed something that would scar anyone for life. A woman was rushed into the ER after attempting to take her own life. She had slit her wrists and her throat. In fact, she had cut almost her entire hand off and her head was being held on by the skin at the back of her neck and some muscle. Somehow, she managed to survive the trip to the hospital, but sadly, she didn't make it through surgery. On top of it all, the nurse was in charge of holding the woman's head in place while the doctors treated her. And after her passing, the doctor had the nurse look down the woman's neck with the head held back as a little anatomy lesson, which is incredibly messed up. Someone died and he's like, hey, now's a great time to study the human body. Come on, take a look. No, just no. Moving on to number seven, we have the motorcycle accident. This story comes from Reddit user Doc in a Box. One night, a motorcycle driver was involved in an accident and suffered from third degree burns all over his body. Sadly, he was dead on arrival. So this dude's job was to transfer the man from the ambulance gurney to the ER bed. But upon doing so, the charred skin on his back separated and his body slipped to the floor. They were left holding his skin while his body just lay there. In our sixth spot, we have The Last Moment. This next story is from Reddit user Sad Trombone, who is an ER nurse. One night, she was performing CPR on a woman whose heart had stopped. During the middle of chest compressions, the woman's hand reached up and grabbed the nurse's wrist. But immediately after, her hand fell back to hanging off the table. Sadly, the nurse wasn't able to save the woman's life. But imagine how shocking it must have been to have a dead woman's arm shoot up at you and grab ya. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the skeleton man. So this next story comes from an ER doctor. One day there was a man waiting in the ER for treatment. To the eye, nothing looked off about him. That was until he removed the hat that he was wearing. Upon doing so, a chunk of skin about the size of a large male hand just flapped off of his skull. Apparently, the dude managed to scalp himself. But here's the thing. 
This happened three days ago and he was only now getting treatment. Turns out he was duct taping it down so that it would stay on or he was wearing that hat so it would stay in place. Eventually when the hat trick wasn't working as well, his wife convinced him to come into the hospital. Ah, uh, I can't. Like isn't that painful? How do you wait three days before treatment? No. Coming in at number 4 we have the makeshift bandage. So if you ever get injured, leave it to the professionals to help you, ok? Chances are you're only gonna make things worse, like this next guy. So apparently this guy was out hiking when he fell on some rocks. The rocks ended up cutting a 3 inch long, half inch deep gash into his leg. When he arrived at the ER he had a bandage on his leg. When it was peeled off, his wound was completely black with dark chunks of fungus falling out of the wound. Apparently when he was hiking, the man decided to make a makeshift bandage by chewing up leaves and moss and then mixing it with mud from the river and then he literally stuffed it into his leg to seal the wound. That's what I like to call an infection waiting to happen. In our third spot we have the man in the room. Imagine looking after a patient who told you he was seeing ghosts in his room. This is exactly what happened to this next ER nurse. So the patient was admitted to a room in the ER at around 1.30 in the morning. But as soon as he was rolled into the room, he started freaking out talking about him. He kept asking the nurses if they could see him. He was so freaked out he demanded a new room. Once in the new room he was fine and he fell asleep. The next morning the nurse went to check in on the man and that's when he said that the hospital room needs to be exercised. Apparently the him he was talking about is a very angry dead man who didn't want anyone else in his room. I would refuse to ever go in that room if I was her. On top of that, the nurse claims that weird things would always happen in that room. Like it was always cold no matter what and the lights would always flicker on and off by themselves. Of course, she never thought much of it until this man came in and told her it was indeed haunted. In our second spot, we have the puncture wound. This next guy was admitted into the ER after a full on fence entered his torso just below his ribs and exited his body above his opposite shoulder. Older. That's a big yikes. Apparently he got into a car accident and hit a fence, which then went right through his car and then right through him. The dude was fully conscious when he arrived to the ER and apparently told the nurse and I quote, I seem to have a splinter that I think you might need to remove. Honey, I think it's more than just a splinter. Thankfully the man managed to survive getting the post and all the wood chips out of his body, but he did have to spend one month in the ICU. And in our number one spot today we have the limb. This next man came into the ER claiming that his arm had been lopped off during a farming accident. He appointed to his left arm, but his left arm appeared to be intact. It wasn't unattached at all. But they did notice that the man was holding a blanket over his shoulder. When they took the blanket away from him, his whole left arm came with it. I would have fainted. That's a big no from me. Uh uh. Starting us off at our number 10 spot, we have snake oil. Eww. Nowadays, the name snake oil salesman refers to someone who is knowingly selling fraudulent goods, but this title actually gets its roots from an actual occupation from back in the 1800s. Oil was extracted from Chinese water snakes, and due to this oil being rich in omega 3s, it was used to reduce inflammation, treat arthritis, and even bursitis. These oils were rubbed on workers' joints after a long and hard day of work, mostly workers who were working on the trans. Continental Railroad. But then came Clark Stanley, the rattlesnake king. Stanley claimed he studied with a hoppy medicine man who convinced Stanley of the incredible snake oil healing powers. He then took this newfound knowledge on the road and performed at Chicago's World Fair in 1893. His act consisted of him taking a rattlesnake out of a bag, cutting it open, and extracting the liquid and claiming it to be the medicinal snake oil. But the FDA later confirmed that there was no trace of real snake oil in his liquid at all. But that didn't stop dishonest doctors and other fraudulent salesmen from attempting to sell the fake snake oil. This then gave this somewhat true and beneficial medical practice a bad name. Folks, if any of you need any supplements for joints or otherwise, use any of the trusted omega-3 oils being sold around the world today. There's also tons of natural foods that will give you a great dose of that stuff too, so no need to go snake hunting. Coming in at our number 9 spot, we have doctors using blow. That's right, we all know the
that is often referred to as blow. Well, back in the day, doctors actually prescribed it to patients who were experiencing toothaches, depression, cyanitis, lethargy, alcoholism, and even impotence. In the mid-1880s, scientists were able to isolate the active ingredient in the coca leaf, known as Erthroxlin coca. Guess what? Pharmaceutical companies loved it. So what happened? Well, it was soon being sold as a lozenge, a tonic, a powder, and even in cigarettes. It even appeared in Sears catalogs. Yeah, remember those things? I mean, I remember the Christmas ones because I would always pick my yearly new toy out of that magazine, but luckily I never even picked or even came across being sold, so I think my parents were thankful for that. But anyway, they were advertised in little boxes with tablets inside, and buyers could purchase them for about 50 cents a box. You didn't even need a prescription from a doctor for it. Fortunately, and I guess unfortunately for others, in 1914, the Harrison Narcotic Act outlawed the production, importation, and distribution of the substance. Other fun fact that many of you might already know, but the same substance was also found in the famous Coca-Cola drink. Another reason for why the soft drink was named Coca-Cola. Coming in at number 8 and staying on the illegal substance train we have dope. How did people in the past help cure one drug epidemic? Well, they made a new one. This is what happened in the late 1880s when the popular drug we all called was used as a substitute instead of morphine. It was known as diamorphine, and the English chemical researcher named C.R. Adler Wright created it in the late 1870s. But it wasn't until a chemist working for the Bayer Company, which is still around to this day, discovered Wright's paper in 1895 and that the drug actually came to market. Bayer claimed it to be five times more effective and less addictive than morphine. So Bayer began marketing laced aspirin in 1898 that was suggested for people suffering from sore throats, coughs, and colds. Bayer continued to rep and also highly tout the product until they noticed users coming back for bottles more and more. Finally, in 1913, Bayer finally stopped production of the drug after it was banned by the FDA altogether. Yeah, I think that was a good call, but I couldn't imagine what the withdrawal problem many people probably went through. I, I can't imagine what it was like. I mean, I know that is one hard drug that is insanely tough to quit, and going cold turkey on anything is so freaking difficult, let alone going cold turkey from a hard that being said, I'm glad we don't actively prescribe it anymore. That I know of. Coming in at our number 7 spot, we have mercury treatment. Today, mercury is popularly known as a potentially poisonous metal that causes extremely harmful effects if exposed in large amounts for a prolonged amount of time. However, this wasn't always the belief. Once upon a time, let's say as far back as the early 20th century, mercury was actually used as a diuretic, disinfectant, and even a laxative. I think we should just stick to our prune juice here, but anyway. It was even used as a treatment for syphilis in some cases. But what's really scary is that doctors back then often mistook mercury poisoning symptoms for syphilis symptoms themselves. So what would they do? They would give them more mercury while they were already mercury poisoned. Freaking yikes guys. It was even used as a dewormer in some cases in people of all ages, young and old. However, merbromin, which is a mercury containing topical antiseptic, is still used to this day to treat minor cuts and scratches and is used widely among many countries. That being said, it is banned in the US for probably obvious reasons. Coming in at number 6 is one that if you ask me, is quite misogynistic and sexist, but anyway, here we go. We have a female pelvic massage. The modern day vibe actually stems from a medical tool doctors used in the 19th century. Yay! Go doctors! Or maybe not. Well, I know many people around the world happily use today, back in the 19th century, they were used to cure a disease known as hysteria in women, also just known as normal human emotions. Hysteria was known to cause depression, anxiety, irritability, sexual desire, insomnia, faintness, and even a bloated stomach. So what would these male 19th century doctors do? Well, they would perform a pelvic massage with one of these and would perform these over a series of treatments. Magically, the woman would feel better, but it was probably just because she hadn't Anyway, eventually there was a device nicknamed the manipulator made by Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville that was able to be brought home and used by the woman at home in the privacy of her own home. And she could use it herself. And she could do it whenever she pleased. So while are known to boost moods, let it be known that hysteria was just a woman who was emotional and not a real disease. I think men and women were just so sexually repressed back then that some doctors thought it might be a good idea and women believed it. Anyway, nowadays if you want to go ahead and use a manipulator by yourself, no matter what your sex, you do not need to do it in front of a doctor and thank God for that. Coming in at our halfway point at number 5, we have bloodletting. For almost 2000 years, losing blood was seen as a good, healthy, and normal thing for people to have done to their bodies. It was also one of the most popular procedures done by surgeons. It was 
was based on a flawed scientific theory that stated humans possessed four humors, aka liquids. Those liquids being blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. In order to cure a disease or restore balance to these liquids, doctors would suggest bloodletting by letting a patient bleed out a little bit and evenly let these fluids restore to equal levels. Sometimes they would even use leeches to suck out the blood from patients, which gives me just as many heebie jeebies as giving blood already does to me. But this was used up until the 19th century, and it is also important to know that in 1838, Henry Clutterback, a lecturer at the Royal College of Physicians, stated that bloodletting is a remedy which, when judiciously employed, it is hardly possible to estimate too highly. Freaking yikes. Once again, time and time again, I am so incredibly thankful that I live in the time period that I do live in, and this is one of those moments. Coming in at our number four spot, we have lithotomies. What is a lithotomy? Well, it was a procedure that was once used in order to remove bladder stones. Ouch. But just wait. As if that didn't sound painful enough already, it was done by a patient lying on their back while a blade was passed into the bladder through the perineum, the soft bit of flesh that is between the sex organ and doctors would then use hands and sometimes other instruments to then remove the stones from the bladder and it probably goes without saying here, but the procedure was quite painful. What is even more crazy is that it had a mortality rate of 50%. The number of these procedures began to decrease in the 19th century and it was replaced with much more humane ways of extraction. Along with that, in the 20th century, healthier diets also made less and less cases of bladder stones and such procedures were no longer as common as they once were. Yeah, thank God. This one is one that I would have just chosen to curl up and die because I am such a big wimp when it comes to any Anything medical that I know I wouldn't be able to take it, which is why these next three become my worst nightmare. Starting us off in our top three at number three and rhyming with our number four spot, you guessed it, we have lobotomies. This is technically the number one spot for me because it sounds the worst in my opinion, but it rhymes, so I put it at number three. But our number one is no picnic either, just so you know. Anyway, if you don't know what a lobotomy is, this is a procedure where doctors would sever connections in the brain's prefrontal lobe by inserting an ice pick into the patient's head. It was usually inserted close to the eye and many patients were not even put to sleep for the procedure. Ah, I can't even talk about it. This one makes me so sick beyond belief. But anyway, a Portuguese neurologist invented the procedure back in 1935, and a year later, the procedure was used in the US thanks to Walter Freeman. Thanks, Walter. He would go around in his automobile and would perform these procedures around the country in quite horrific ways, and quite often was not precise in his execution either. Thankfully, this procedure was put to rest after advances in were made and Freeman performed his last lobotomy in 1967. Nope, 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 and no. Coming in at our number two spot, we have shocking arousals. During the 19th century, impotence in a man was believed to have stemmed from too much sex or or even just the opposite, too little of it. So what was the cure for impotence? Well, electric shocks, of course. Surgeon Samuel W. Gross stated in his book that mass gonorrhea, sexual excesses, and constant excitement of the organs without gratification would lead to impotence. So doctors would then shock them back to arousal. Some doctors would even put patients in bathtubs filled with electrodes, which apparently restored sexual desire in just as little as six sessions. Oh, only that many. That's not so bad, I guess. <laughs> not. By the late 1800s, there were even electropathic belts or electric belts that were used to help men from kidney pains, sciatic nerve issues, backaches, headaches, nervous exhaustion, and even impotence. While we know today that impotence is sparked by mental and physical illnesses, in some places it is still believed that low energy wave shock therapy can improve ED. I think that would have to be a last resort because that still sounds terrifying to me. And finally, coming in at our number one spot is one almost as bad as a lobotomy. We have trepanation. Well, what is this? Well, this was a procedure that was done for centuries and is actually the oldest form of surgery that we know of. The procedure consisted of a human taking on the doctor role and scraping a hole in the skull of the human in the patient role. No one is quite 100% sure what the purpose of this procedure was, but most people believe it was for letting out demons that were believed to be inhabiting the patient's body. Quite surprisingly, many humans survived and healed from this barbaric procedure. Now, were they cured of their demons though? No one quite knows. While doctors no longer do this to cure demons, there are cases of a similar procedure being done to help relieve pressure and excess blood from the brain. There was a case in Australia where it was used and if not for the ancient procedure, the patient would have passed away due to a blood clot on the brain. Coming in number 10, we have when you know you know. Let's kick off this one with Reddit user through the shades. This person has been working in a hospital for a long time. They didn't count after thousands of patients, some of them very dramatic, and some of them came in calm and focused. There was one day when someone was brought in to the emergency and they were in some pretty rough shape. But for some reason they had the most relaxed composure that they had ever seen on a patient. This person needed a tourniquet on right away and they were losing a lot of blood. Right when our Reddit user doctor was applying this tourniquet, the patient looked at them and said, I'm dying. In that moment they watched their eyes closed and they passed away. Through the shades wrote that they could 
always tell who really knew they were going to die and who didn't. Some people would just be screaming I'm dying because they were panicking and scared about what was going to happen to them, but this person knew that their time was coming and they calmly moved on to whatever comes after we die. That must have been one of the most frightening and exhilarating moments of their life. I mean I don't want to die anytime soon, but it would be cool to find out the answer to one of life's biggest mysteries. Coming in number 9 we have the body. Reddit user really unbelievable said that they were a surgeon and responded to a question on reddit asking what was the craziest thing that doctors have heard before patients died. Now because this guys reddit name is really unbelievable it's going to make this one a little harder to believe but I'm not here to snoop through everyone's reddit profile to find out if they were actually a surgeon. I'm here to bring you the craziest stuff I can find. So this doctor wrote that they were in the room with a patient and he was on his deathbed. He was about to go and he kept saying there's a body behind the oak tree over and over again. Of course this was a very creepy thing to say as you're dying. I don't think someone who's about to say goodbye to the land of the living would be keen on pulling one last prank. Or they would, I have no idea what it feels like to die. But in these final moments those words shocked everyone in the room and the police came in to get some information but not before the man died. So they took those few words and then launched a small search behind the man's house. There was a wooded area and even though there were a few oak trees nothing substantial was found. So maybe this guy was just messing with everyone or maybe he was telling the truth but didn't have enough strength to give them all the details. Coming at number 8 we have where's my dog? Ok now we have a really sad one for you so you better grab some tissues cause this one is a tear jerker. Reddit user X Texan Pride X wrote in about a time they had someone rushed into the emergency because they were in a serious car accident. The person who was brought into the emergency had one of their arms ripped off and he was losing blood very fast. It was pretty clear that this guy wasn't going to make it. His blood pressure was dropping too fast but right before he passed out he asked if his dog was ok. See his dog had been in the car with him when he was in the crash and all he wanted to know was if his dog was ok. The doctor didn't answer him because he didn't want to cause him any more stress because his dog didn't survive the crash. It wasn't long after the question that he passed out and then passed on. I guess one can hope that when he got up to the pearly gates his good boy was waiting for him there. I told you this was a sad one. Coming in at number 7 we have dad's last words. Now this one doesn't come from a doctor but it happened in a hospital and it was someone's last words so it's pretty much what we're looking for here. Reddit user artsy fartsy talked about when their father was in the hospital with lung cancer. His dad lived a long life and was around 80 now but he hadn't always treated his body the best. He was a smoker for most of his life and when he got older all of that caught up with him. A reddit user talked about how his father was a foot soldier in world war 2 and when he would tell old stories about the war he said he would always talk about how he used to sing this song. Show me the way home I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had a drink about an hour ago and it went straight to my head. I can see how that would be a hit while you're marching during the war. Well while his dad was on his deathbed he was in and out of consciousness in the hospital. He was very sick and they had him on a lot of medication. Well a reddit user said that he managed to come to for long enough to sing that song one final time before he passed. Those were the last words he ever said. Coming at number 6 we have how does it happen? Reddit user JL Blessing Jr talked about the time they were working in a hospital and they had a patient who was very sick. They were in the late stages of cancer and they knew they weren't going to make it very much longer. This patient turned to them and said how do I die? And that was the last thing they said before they passed away. I mean if you're in that situation as a doctor and you have someone say that to you how do you even answer it? It seems like such a difficult thing to respond to. Do you tell them what's actually going to happen to their body and how they're going to pass on to the other side? Or do you tell them something sweet so they feel at ease? Of course you don't want to make this person more afraid of death than they probably already are but at the same time do you want to lie to someone who's about to die? Coming in at number 5 we have you know what's coming. Sometimes you can have a premonition about your own life. You get a gut feeling and you don't know why but there's something telling you a hint from the future. Who knows what that is but we have a pretty interesting moment of it in our next story. Reddit user pizza with artichoke talked about a time they were about to perform surgery on a patient. It was someone with an infected heart valve from drug use. That is something I didn't even know could happen. They should tell you that when they're trying to get kids not to do drugs. Well the patient was laying on their bed and they hadn't fed them the anesthesia yet. The guy sat up and said I'm going to die aren't I? Apparently he had been through a couple of these surgeries before and the chance of surviving the next one was pretty low. He died on the table during the surgery. That's a wild story and it brings up the question did he see his future and know he was going to die? Or did he convince himself that he was going to die and because of that it increased his chances of dying on the table. And if you think I have the answer to this question you guys are dead wrong I make top 10 lists. Coming at number 4 we have Hey Angel, a reddit user who deleted their account
account said that they used to work in a hospital and they would have to go to the ICU quite often. There was one patient who they would see all the time and for the most part they would have a casual conversation. Then one day they seemed a little off. He looked at her and said, hey angel. This was very strange because he had never called her angel before. After that he just laid back and went to sleep. Later that night he passed away. What was so weird about this was when he said angel it seemed like he wasn't looking right at her. It was like he was looking behind her but there was no one there. This could have been a hallucination from someone who's about to pass on. I mean when your body's getting ready to go you can have some pretty wild things happen to your mind. But what if he really saw something there? What if there was someone waiting to take him to the other side? Coming in at number 3 we have what a way to go. Alright here's one that's a little bit more of a warmer story compared to the other ones on this list. Reddit user Cinder Hella talked about a story her dad told her from being a doctor. He was a doctor in an inner city hospital and they would get a lot of people who had substance abuse problems. One day a guy came in who was there quite often and was also known for being extremely rude to the nurses and doctors. This time when the guy came in he was in the worst shape he'd ever been in. His lungs were full of pneumonia and his heart was in even worse shape than that. He was in a room by himself and our reddit user Dr. Dad saw on one of the monitors that he was having an irregular heartbeat. So he walked into the patient's room and stood in the doorway. He asked the dude how he was feeling and he said with my hands you jerk off. And then he died right after that. I mean that's one hell of a line to go out on. Coming in at number 2 we have by yourself. British guy ESQ wrote on reddit about how he was working as a doctor and he had a patient who was a quite a bit older and very sick. The guy had stage 4 lung cancer and there was no chance of him beating it. So it was only a matter of time before he passed on. This patient had a feeling that he was going to pass that night and he asked our reddit user doctor if he could sit with him that night. See the old dude had no family and he was there all by himself and was dying alone. The guy just didn't want to die alone and there was no way our reddit user was going to let that happen. The last thing the old man said before he passed on was thank you. And coming at the number 1 spot we have a kiss. Our final one today comes from reddit user Quacaro. They were working as a doctor and they had one patient who was dying from brain cancer. Something they would have to do is come in and speak loudly to him to see if he was conscious or not. It was something that our doctor didn't like to do so they asked his wife if she would do it. She kindly obliged. One day they were doing this routine check and the doctor came in and the wife started speaking loudly to him to see if he was conscious. In that moment he took her hand and kissed it and then passed away. Not final words but as clear a message as anyone could ever send. Starting off with number 10 is Shiro Ishii. Now during World War II this man was a Japanese microbiologist and lieutenant general in the biological warfare unit of the Japanese army. He was a director of unit 731 which is where he developed and used biological weapons which he tested on prisoners of war and other civilians. Which is <laughs> illegal. Just putting that out there. This man alone was responsible for some of the most notorious war crimes of imperial Japan. He killed over 10,000 people by exposing them to diseases like anthrax and the plague. He would do this by injecting them with the diseases but disguising them as vaccinations and then would just record the effects and not tell the prisoners what was going on as they were just dying from the plague. He would stimulate heart attacks and strokes among patients as well as forced he would order prisoners limbs to be amputated so he could study their blood loss. He would order the limbs to then be attached to other parts of the body just to see what would happen. One person had their stomach surgically removed and their esophagus attached to their intestines instead just to see what would happen. They obviously died. He would inject horse urine into their kidneys, put them in low pressure chambers till their eyes popped out and none of that was done for any military or medical purpose whatsoever. He was just a sadist. Coming in at number 9 is Marcel Petiona. Now born in 1897, this French doctor slash seal killer started off fighting in a World War 1 but after being injured he was sent home. He went to medical school and worked as an intern at a mental hospital afterwards which was controversial since he himself was diagnosed with multiple mental illnesses and of course he was addicted to when his internship was over he managed to attract patients to his practice by forging fake credentials. While working he started performing illegal applying narcotics to patients for personal use and his first victim was Louise Delavaux. Marcel had an affair with her and then she disappeared during their relationship and witnesses saw Marcel loading some big trunk into his car which was presumably her body. The doctor was finally exposed when his neighbours continuously complained to the police about this foul stench coming from his house and an excessive amount of smoke just coming out of his chimney. The police initially thought it was a fire so they called firemen to his house and they found a massive fire in a coal stove in his basement. Basement. But within the fire, scattered all over his basement, were human remains of over 60 patients. He was later beheaded, and rightfully so. 
number eight, we have lobotomies. I've been researching this medical procedure ever since the first time I saw it in a movie in my early teens. It's just so fascinatingly screwed up that I'm like, how could they even do that? So this procedure was done as a form of psychosurgery, which is a surgery that tries to treat a mental illness or at least reduce the symptoms of one. The procedure started being done in the 30s and it started off as a hole being cut into the skull and injecting ethanol into the brain to sever the fibers that connect the frontal lobe of the brain to the other parts. As if that wasn't bad enough, it evolved into the ice pick method, which is what I've seen a lot of and you probably have in movies as well. It involves a metal pick being put through the eye socket of the patient and then being moved side to side inside to separate the frontal lobe from the thalamus. Like surely that would hurt. If someone is putting an ice pick through your eye socket, that has to hurt. It was extremely inhumane and was mostly performed on women to make them less spirited. It would literally change your personality and make you just not there. You just weren't present. It has the potential of damaging your intellect or severe brain damage. These people would just become incompetent afterwards and not be able to function normally in society. If you've seen the movie Sucker Punch or if you've seen Bojack Horseman, they perform lobotomies in those two and I'm just looking at them and I'm just like... <sighs> Filling our number 7 slot is Dr. Michael Swango. Born in 1954, this American serial killer is quite the monster. Former US Marine recruit and medical doctor, Michael got a surgical internship at Ohio State University Medical Center in 1983. But the nurses started noticing that seemingly healthy patients were dying at an alarming rate for no reason at all and each time Michael had been the floor intern that day. One nurse even caught him injecting some medicine into a patient who became quite sick later the same day. Her accusations were met with allegations of paranoia and nothing really happened from it. His internship ended and he started working as an emergency medical technician at the Adams County Ambulance Corps. His co-workers realized every time Michael was the one preparing food or coffee and bringing it to them, they would all become violently ill for no reason. An investigation was launched and he was arrested for poisoning patients and colleagues and was sentenced to five years in prison. But the bull it doesn't even end there. I wish it did, but it really doesn't. When he was released, he changed his name to Daniel Adams and was back in the medical scene again colleagues and patients. He then fled to Zimbabwe when suspicion arose again, where he was again working as a doctor, killing more people. He was eventually caught in 2000, thank God, and was sentenced to three consecutive life terms. And he full on deserves it. Like. Now at number 6 is Dr. John Hall. Now back in 2004, this dentist was accused by the state dental board of committing and battery. How did he do that, you ask? He used to fill syringes with some unknown liquid and put it in his female patients' mouths while they were numb, claiming it was a cleansing solution. His assistants found it increasingly odd how he always asked them to leave the room to get tools that he never used, but then would overhear him telling the patient to swallow something once they were alone. Upon more investigation, the assistants found out that the syringes were filled with holes and since the patients couldn't taste anything, they had no idea. Who the hell does that? Like, who gains anything from that? That is disgusting. The assistants turned over the evidence to the police, and another patient came out claiming he had climbed on top of her and started grinding on her, which, by the way, is not part of a dentist's job description. When exposed, he claimed he was taking Propatia and collecting his to see the effects, but obviously that was bullshit. Coming in at number 5 is Karl Klauberg. Now Karl was a German gynecologist that conducted medical experiments on the prisoners at Auschwitz camp. In 1942 he approached one of his seniors and asked him if he could perform mass sterilizations on women at the camp for his experiments and the senior agreed. He would do messed up things like injecting acid into the women's uteruses with no anesthesia which resulted in so many women dying or suffering from permanent damage. The point of the experiment was to figure out how long it would take to sterilize a thousand Jewish women and the answer was with 10 assistants you could do it in a day. 700 women survived the ordeal but many lost their lives. Karl moved to another camp and Soviet troops captured him there and brought him to the Soviet Union where he was sentenced to 25 years in jail. At number 4 is Harold Shipman, the only British doctor in history to ever be found guilty of his patients. In 1974, Harold became a general practitioner at a practice in West Yorkshire. Things were going fine, but a year later he was found forging prescriptions for patients so they could take pithidine, this type of for personal, not medical use. Later on, people started getting concerned due to the high death rate of his patients and the number of cremation forms that he had needed countersigned. He killed most of them by injecting diamond 
that bloodstream and then forging their death certificate saying they died of poor health or natural causes. He ended up killing 218 people altogether and was convicted in 2000 but hung himself in a cell four years later. Filling our number 3 slot is Dr. Hazard. Born in 1867, Dr. Linda Burfield demanded her patients call her Dr. Hazard, so I don't even know how that didn't raise any concerns with anyone, but sure. She was infamous for the unconventionally dangerous method she used to try and cure diseases, which garnered her the nickname Starvation Doctor. She was adamant that fasting cured all diseases from the common cold to cancer. Burfield made her patients go on a draconian diet which lacked all basic nutritional elements, meaning you had two bowls of tomato broth and two oranges a day for up to a month. By 1912 she was sentenced to two years in prison for the death of Claire Williamson who weighed less than 50 pounds when she died. After her release she opened up the school of health where she continued to starve her patients. Mind you she wasn't doing this maliciously, she genuinely thought it would help. She killed 15 people through her methods and actually died herself in 1938 while fasting to get better. And plot twist, she wasn't even a doctor, she never even went to medical school school so I don't even know how she got hired anywhere. Now at number 2 is Dr. Farid Fatter. Now most doctors would love having a high survival rate amongst their patients, but Dr. Fatter was not one of those people. As an oncologist, he made his money by providing chemotherapy to cancer patients and to those that literally did not have cancer. Now hear me out. As a greedy pig he was, he realized his patients weren't profitable after they went into remission, aka became cancer free, so he just didn't tell them that they were. He just continued their treatment which isn't just oh take a few extra Advils a week. It was chemo. That's not a joke. It was pain. It was nerve damage. It was nausea. Many other side effects just so he could buy himself a castle in Lebanon. Really? Really? Do you really need a castle that bad? I don't think so. Not only did he continue chemo for those who no longer had cancer, he would just diagnose healthy patients with cancer who did not have it at all just so they could do chemotherapy. The man was loaded by the time the police caught on and pled guilty to being the biggest scum of the earth. No surprise. His court date keeps getting postponed because of the hundreds of people still coming forward against him. That's just disgusting. Now, I don't believe in capital punishment, but I mean, some people are worthy. And I'm not saying he is. But I'm not saying he's not. And finally, at number one is Yosef Rudolf Mengele, aka the Angel of Death. Yosef was an officer and physician in Auschwitz camp and was one of the people who would not only choose who was going to the gas chambers, but he would be the one administering the cyanide pesticide. In the children's block, he literally drew a 150 centimeter line towards the ceiling and any kid that was shorter than the line was sent to the gas chambers. The rest of them were used in his experiments and he was especially interested in identical twins. He didn't care about the health, safety or emotional and physical suffering of any of his victims. He was a sociopath. He would amputate their limbs, infect one twin with something like typhus and transfer the blood of the other to the infected one. Most of the specimens died while being experimented on, but if they didn't, they would just be killed and dissected after they were no longer of use. And he was so nice to these kids, he would make them call him Uncle Yosef and feed them candy and then later gas them. Like how do you have that little empathy? One night he killed 14 pairs of twins because he kept injecting their hearts with chloroform and if one twin died, he'd just kill the other one on purpose just to compare. Mengele would inject chemicals into their eyes. He even sewed two Romani twins together back to back in a feeble attempt to create man-made conjoined twins, but both died in a few days. He somehow survived the war and escaped to South America and was never caught despite killing a very high number of people. How do you not get caught for doing that? That is such a gross human rights violation, I can't even. <sighs> Getting triggered, don't talk to me right now.